Do you think you can toss me over the gate if you... Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 gave us a great send off to the OG Guardians, but it teased an even bigger journey for Mantis, the Guardian that a lot of us have taken for granted. Quill, Groot, Drax, the chick with the antenna, all gone. So, if you're gonna like, go off the comic source material, Mantis is going to play a huge role in Avengers Secret Wars and could be the key to creating a new Marvel Cinematic Universe. And we've got videos out now about the next big cosmic crossover, Star-Lord crossing over with the X-Men and the Eternals and what's next for the Warlock movie, but we have been saving this one because this story is all about culminating the multiverse saga. See, Volume 3 ended with Mantis leaving on a journey of self-discovery. So, let's talk about what adventures lie ahead for Mantis and how her journey connects to Kang's Secret Wars and the X-Men and how she may be on the path to becoming the MCU's Celestial Madonna. And yeah, I am a material dog. Different Madonna, but more on that in a bit. So in Guardians 3, we hear Mantis talk about how her whole life she served Ego. Now remember that Mantis, like Star-Lord, is also a child of Ego the Living Planet, who is also a Celestial. Her whole life she served Ego's will. Remember, she was one of Ego's many, many children that Yondu delivered to him. Ego hoped that one of his kids would have a Celestial spark inside of them that would have allowed him to trigger the expansion. Ego killed the kids that were of no use to him, but kept Mantis because her abilities helped him to sleep. Remember that info for later. After joining the Guardians, she has been a loyal member of the team, but never made her own decisions. So she ends Volume 3, leaving to go find herself and do what she wants to do. So basically, a journey of self-discovery, similar to the journey that we think that we'll see Adam Warlock go on, which we talked about in this video. And by the way, everybody, I just want to show off this really cool Doug as Rocket tee, which is available in our merch store, and you can find that link in the description. We have tons of fun tees and gear that I think you'll like, and shopping our merch store is a great way that you can directly support our channel. So check it out with the link below. Now back to Mantis. In the MCU, she has been a really fun character. She's adorable, funny, and the way her and Drax carried the holiday special was phenomenal. We even finally got to see her fight and brilliantly combine her empathic abilities with action. But I think it's fair to say that the MCU's version of the Mantis character has yet to reach her fullest potential. Co-creator of the Mantis character, Steve Englehart, has even said that he was not pleased with the MCU's take on Mantis, at least in volume two. He said, I was not happy with Mantis's portrayal. Wait, is, is he French or something? No, I'm just trying to do a voice. Don't, just, just read it. It's just be normal. Okay. I was not happy with Mantis's portrayal. That character has nothing to do with Mantis. I will say that I like the film quite a lot overall. They're doing good stuff, and I really enjoyed my night at the movies, so long as I turned my brain off to the fact that that's not Mantis up there. I really don't know why you would take a character who is as distinctive as Mantis is and do a completely different character and still call her Mantis. That, I do not know. Now, personally, I've loved what the MCU has done with Mantis, but I can understand why Englehart felt this way about his baby. But with the direction they seem to be taking Mantis after Guardians 3, I think that Englehart may be happy with what's to come for the character. Like Mantis said, she needs to find herself. So we need to remember that she has yet to become her true self and still has a lot of growing to do as a character. So in the comics, what is she like a big bug that eats boys or something? Oh, buddy, you have no idea. This is about to get weird. So Mantis was first introduced in 1973's Avengers 120. Now, in the comics, we see Mantis taken and mutated by the Kree. The Kree being the enormous alien empire that we've met several times before in the MCU. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Did you say mutated? Oh yeah, Mantis is what's known in the comics as a mutate, not to be confused with mutant. Mutants possess the mutant X gene. Those who have the mutant X gene typically see it activate around the same time they hit puberty, giving them a special ability, aka superpowers. Mutates, on the other hand, are individuals who aren't born with their mutation, but are mutated by an outside source, such as being bit by a radioactive spider, getting hit with gamma radiation, or being injected with super soldier serum. Now, we've done a few videos theorizing that the MCU may have a different take on mutants than the comics. After all, Marvel Studios was not able to use or even mention mutants in their projects until Phase 4 of the MCU. And with a character like Ms. Marvel, who is not a mutant in the comics, suddenly being revealed to be a mutant in the MCU... Like a mutation. We think it's possible that we could see the MCU reclassify all enhanced beings with altered DNA as mutants. Or maybe they were just trying to get us excited for the X-Men by doing a very confusing retcon of Kamala's powers. So, back to Mantis's comic history. The Kree believed that Mantis would become what's known as the Celestial Madonna. Just like a pair, you are gonna take Doug there. Doug, no, not that Madonna. Why are you yelling at me? You're the one who said Madonna. I just like Madonna sometimes. No, no, no. Celestial Madonna. Right, let's break down Celestial Madonna and what that means for Mantis. Now, a Celestial is essentially a god. Small G, son. 
Ego was a celestial, and we've seen a slew of celestials such as Arisham and the Eternals movie. Now, a Madonna is essentially an idealized goddess that gives birth to a savior. So take Mary, the mother of Jesus, as an example of a Madonna. Or, you know, Marilyn Feige. Or Kevin Feige's mother Marilyn, sure. But what's interesting about that is in the MCU, Mantis's mother can be viewed as a Mary type figure. Ego, who is essentially God, impregnated Mantis's mom to give Ego an heir and to help him accomplish his expansion. Now, I know that Guardians 2 is not at the top of like anybody's MCU rankings, but it's very important to look back at that movie to understand what's next for Mantis and how she will affect the multiverse saga. The Guardians holiday special gave us a reminder that Mantis is indeed a daughter of Ego, the same way Star-Lord is his son, thus making Star-Lord and Mantis half brother and sister. And while that was a heartwarming moment for the Christmas special, they were definitely using this as an opportunity to remind fans of Mantis's celestial origins. Hey person, I got a question. Doug already told you the Celestial Madonna did not launch the Blonde Ambition Tour. No, 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 not that. The Star-Lord was the only one of Ego's spawn that inherited his celestial powers, right? Yes. And Star-Lord lost those powers when he destroyed Ego? That's right. So why does Mantis still have her powers and Star-Lord doesn't? Okay, that's a great question and actually a question that I've heard a few times before. There are a few possible explanations for this. One, that Mantis's empathic abilities in the MCU don't even come from Ego. Mantis may in fact be an MCU mutate or a mutant, and it could be a mere coincidence that she also happens to be the daughter of a Celestial. Now in Guardians 2, we learn via a bet between Star-Lord and Drax that Mantis's antennae are connected to her empathic abilities. They have something to do with my empathic abilities. In the MCU, it is yet to be confirmed what species Mantis is. So we can't say for certain that this ability isn't shared amongst all the people of her species. It could be revealed that Mantis is unique among her people, however, and that her antenna are a mutation similar to how Namor's wings are his mutation. But in a deleted scene for Guardians 2, we do see Mantis's mom with Ego and she too has antenna. So it's likely that all of her species have antenna and they are all empaths. Or perhaps they all have different abilities which they use their antenna for, such as telepathy, precognition, or telekinesis. That's option one. Option two, Mantis's abilities do come from being Ego's daughter. But unlike Peter, the celestial light within her did not die when Ego was destroyed. See, we already know that Mantis and Peter are very different. Peter was able to start the expansion and he had powers. Mantis had abilities, but not the right combination of powers to help start the expansion. So it is possible that Mantis's abilities are connected to the power of the celestials. And if that's the case, then the celestial light is still alive within her. Remember that for later. Okay. So now I have to talk about Kang and how he connects to this in a big, big way. In the comics, Kang finds out about this whole Celestial Madonna prophecy of the Creeps. So then he decides that he wants to have a child with Mantis, making him the father of the Space Messiah, or in other words, God. So we see Kang romantically pursuing Mantis, and this is when she learns that she's destined to become the Celestial Madonna. Now, we don't have time to break down the entire story, which spanned across several different comic titles. It is, however, really fun and very weird. At one point, it even features Mantis marrying Tony Dalton's character from Hawkeye in a way that's officiated by Immortus. The MCU has obviously taken these characters down different paths. But there is one weird story in the comics that I do want to talk about, and that is when Mantis gets blown up and pieces of herself are spread across the universe, and each piece represents a different side of Mantis. Think of it kind of like the Council of Sheldons. Where's Jock Sheldon? Eventually, these Mantis find each other and reconnect, forming the one true Mantis, and she accepts her role as a Celestial Madonna. And that's what I think we're going to see happen in the MCU. Instead of Mantis being blown up into different versions of herself, across the universe, I think we'll see Mantis meet variants of herself from the multiverse. After all, at the end of Guardians 3, we do see Mantis leaving with her new pets, the Avalis. Oh yeah, what's that again? Who are they again? What's that? All right, buddy, so we see the Guardians fighting one of these monsters at the start of Volume 2 because they were trying to protect the sovereign space batteries from these monsters who eat batteries. Now, in that movie, we learned that these animals can travel through different dimensions. Basically, they're creatures with the ability to travel the multiverse like America Chavez. And in Volume 3, Mantis makes an empathic connection connection to them. So when Mantis leaves, she's going off on a journey to find herself. But what if she literally finds variants of herself in other universes? And what if these variants are all different metaphorical species of a multiversal celestial Madonna? Perhaps we could even learn that the multiverse once had a celestial goddess that created said multiverse. And maybe the Council of Kangs, that's the multiversal team of Kangs that ruled the multiverse, maybe they blew up that celestial Madonna to take over the multiverse. And when they blew her up, pieces of her were scattered throughout the multiverse. Just like when Mantis was blown up in the comics. Yeah, that's pretty weird, man. Yeah, but Kang did something similar in the comics. So in the books, his true love was Ravona Renslayer, who of course we met in Loki. And in the comics, Ravona kept getting reincarnated in different eras and then dying in Kang's arms. So it turns out that in the distant future, Kang can actually send her essence back through all 
of time to give himself endless chances to save her life, and instead he had to watch her die thousands of times. Kang could have done something similar with Mantis in the MCU, meaning that our Mantis is just one of many Manti in many different universes, and each Mantis represents a different aspect of the Celestial Madonna that once was. Think of it like the nine pieces of eight from the Pirates of the Caribbean. The nine pieces of eight were used by the Pirate Lords to confine the goddess Calypso to a human form, but when the pieces were brought together and burned, it returned Calypso to her true form. So perhaps that is what the Kang who eventually becomes He Who Remains is trying to do. Capture all the Mantis from across the multiverse, combine them, and restore the Celestial Madonna. But why would they want to do that? Well, okay, remember, look, and I know this gets a little confusing, but the Kang we met in Quantum Mania is the enemy of the Council of Kangs. Okay, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. All right, so here's a quick refresher on the MCU's Kang. He Who Remains, the Kang that we met in the finale of Loki Season 1, he was once a Kang. He wiped out all of his variants and ended the multiverse of war, creating the sacred timeline and became the ruler of the multiverse. But after his death in Loki, we saw the sacred timeline collapse. Now in this moment, billions if not trillions of years of time began to pass all at once. Past, present, and future all happened instantaneously. This is why in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, we see a council of Kangs ruling a vast multiverse. And the Kang that's trapped in the quantum realm is seeking to destroy his other variants, as well as wipe out all these extra timelines. He is the Kang who we think eventually will become he who remains. We did a whole theory video about that that was pretty great. An infinite amount of the start another multiversal war, and I just <laughs> end up right back here anyways. So, then we have Mantis. I am Mantis. who is half goddess with her celestial genes. She is the daughter of a being that had the ability to create galaxies and suns. So Kang would want to use this celestial Madonna's power to conquer the multiverse or maybe to create a new universe. So wait, then how is Mantis around at the same time as he who remains if he put all the pieces ever back together to conquer the multiverse? Bro, when you say things like at the same time, you have to remember that time is relative when we discuss the multiverse and variant timelines. He who remains exists outside of time and has constructed the sacred timeline in a circular motion that occurs again and again and again. And it happens again and again and again because it's supposed to. Think of it like you're looking at lots of different save files on your computer and you can access any of them at any time. So we have theorized that his plan all along may be for the multiversal war to happen again and again and again. And the war happens the exact same way every time so that he always ends up back on top. But it's also possible that after Kang used the Celestial Madonna's power, he then broke her up back into pieces and re-scattered her across the sacred timeline so that she couldn't be used as a threat against him and his rule. Person? Yeah, buddy? Yeah, I miss the six rainbow rocks. Those were simpler times. Before the dark times. But stay with me here. This is where the Mantis theory gets really, really good. So, we keep using the term Celestial Madonna like she's destined to give birth to a space baby messiah. Uh huh, uh huh, yeah, far that. That's good, that's good, good. But what if, instead of her giving birth to a literal space baby, instead she gives metaphorical birth to a new universe? You lost me. Okay, so look, in Kang Dynasty, all the heroes are going to face off against Kang and will probably lose like they did in Infinity War. And then Kang will successfully create a new universe. This movie is followed up by Avengers Secret Wars. In the comic book Secret Wars, the multiverse ended and Doom created a new world where he was God. In the MCU Secret Wars, that's probably going to be Kang. And this new world will have all the variants from all the other Marvel movies from over the years and TV shows and stuff. Very fun. But after Kang is defeated, the heroes are going to have to create a new universe or a new multiverse. In the comics, this was the work of Franklin Richards and the Molecule Man, but in the movies, I think this is going to be the work of Mantis. Because she has the power of the Celestials inside of her, she is the only hero who would have the actual ability to create new universes. After all, the Celestials do create galaxies, right? Yeah, that's right. So, Mantis's Celestial powers have been scattered across the multiverse. Once they're combined again in Secret Wars, she will be able to provide the energy to give birth to a new universe. Hence, the Celestial Madonna. That is extremely cool. Thank you, high five. But hey, if you're ever feeling confused or have questions about the multiverse saga, Screen Crush is the place to be. I'm so confused. These are confusing times. <laughs> We're gonna give you theories and insights to help you better understand and overall enjoy everything the MCU has coming up. So let me know, do you think Mantis is on her way to discovering that she is indeed the Celestial Madonna? Will Kang use her to not give birth to an heir, but to a sacred timeline that he can control? And could we see Mantis be responsible for giving rise to a brand new universe after Secret Wars that will reset the Marvel multiverse? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.